Yeah, so there, David, if you're going to go for head scissor, crisscross your ankles, go on the ball of the bottom foot, extend his head away from his spine. Uh, now, slight rotation. Cairo Cracker. Boom, there we go. Sometimes I find when you're in that cradle with a one hand hand pad grab, his hands, see when you grab, you tend to go towards the fingers and the fingers curve inward, oh, yeah, yeah. so then it's gonna slip. Bend his arm the other way, his hand the other way. Flex his palm backwards, uh, grab the hand pad on the fingers. Yeah, so watch, take your, yep, yeah, that's it. And you grab his finger, there you go. And then this way, that, that's not flexible, right? Oh, that's take great. one or two fingers, uh -huh. and that's it. Yeah, take the small one, that's just kind. Beautiful. Smells like thigh. Hey guys, so just options, options, options. So. We have that underhook, we have that shoulder choke, we're working in that position. We migrate north-south, so it's my choice if I wind the spine first in the opposite direction, then slingshot it in, or if I go for it directly in right away. Let him do the work. I want to be aware of that other hand, so I'm keeping pressure. I get up to a north-south. That's what I want. So I have an arm neutralization. I want to have my ears fully addressed, right? My, my knees are like earmuffs on them. If I'm just holding him, I want to have a safety space under his face. If it was a more extreme circumstance and I pivot out, then I can lean on his face and his neck, right? Which is far more severe. We're getting into a, a restraint circumstance that is veering on mortal. I see him pulling out a weapon. I'm entitled to use lethal force. That deviates the neck, grinds the face, rolls it. That's hard. You lift your foot up, stack your body up, all your weights on him, or you bounce his head off the planet, which is lethal intent, right? So you have options there. You're not helpless. A second option is I can elongate the neck. Look, I'm barely squeezing. I'm just squeezing my thighs together, my knees aren't even touching yet, they will. And I go usually with a crisscrossed ankle, get up on the ball of one foot. That gives you, you have enough squeeze, boom, like that, right? That's just the squeeze is bad. If I add rotation, oh. huge deviation, yeah? But I can also play with a crooked head scissor, which is the close knee is gonna be tight, and I'm gonna slide the other one off, leaning on him so I can rotate him. So it's my choice, yeah, like castanets. I can keep oh. this straight arm, I can keep this bent arm. His other arm right now is trapped under my leg, I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna push him to encourage him to get out. He's gonna wanna get out the other side, he's gonna in fact wanna roll and come up. Yep. So then there's a good position. Again, in the domain of positional asphyxia, sometimes people will say zero pressure on back and so they'll advocate going across the neck like that, which puts a lot more strain on the arm, right? So you gotta be careful not to shear his shoulder off. But the basic idea, is that from whatever chosen north-south I have, I'm in that position, I'm gonna keep my underhook facing the back Why? Why do I wanna have my head here? Yeah, I don't want his free hand gouging me. The likelihood that a heel is gonna do much to the top of my head is low, whereas if I go here, I'm not stopping him from getting on his belly, which is his main defense. I'm biting knees and his other hand can get me. So I always wanna to go to this position. What's my primary attack on this underhook? Lift up on my elbow, choose one rib, just like that one tooth that you hate, and then I can slide over. I get him here. I will generally try to trap his other arm here if I can. Right when I move, if I can get his other hand in this position, like that, that's a good one for me. Right. So sometimes when you're here, as you turn, he'll start fiddling, and I'll, I'll put it in the position. It's just an option, and you can get him here. If you don't get this hand, then I want to sit all the way down on my heel, so there's no way he's getting into my groin. If I'm all the way down, if I'm up like this. These are access paths to the uh, inner sanctum. Yeah, so I want to get that tight. I'll be under him as an anvil, and then I'll slide it out. And do I want to push him straight down, or what am I doing with this arm? What's my main joint affectation? Push forward. Yeah, be tight, tight, tight. Yeah, so the main thing that I'm attacking is the shoulder. So fixating on the rotation or elongation of this is irrelevant. I want to rotate. I need to stretch that joint open. So I have two directions that I'm primarily going to do. I'll keep my leg in him. I pull it wide, and then I push it forward. That's going to lock it. If I just stay here where he's strong and tight, and I uh, rotate, it's uh, painful, but he's strong. As soon as I pull it with one hand, I rotate, yep. pull it just elongate, and then I push down, it's already locking. And then I can start to where I push his face away, grab his chin if I want, I can lean here, and there's not a lot of pressure on his back, I have a good grip. If this does anything, I can grip it, take it to the back, start to work, right? That's what I'm looking for. Uh, now south to a hammer on. That makes sense? <laughs> Almost your last one. Your last one. That's it. Try it out. This is here.
So, well, mm -hmm. the pan, I forgot what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But to go to the hammerlock. You got it. This is all we're going to do, guys. We're going to start with the partner prone on the back. Boom, boom, boom. This is all I need to see. So we're going to be working on the head scissor tonight. We'll start out with the most basic of things. So normally we're looking to guide the face. Lots of ways you can do it. You can motivate it with knuckles uh, in the cheek, but you're really trying to count one or two of his teeth with your knuckles. It can be the mid knuckle, it can be the punching knuckle, whatever you like. My preference is usually to take the tip of the nose and to curl it underneath into the infraorbital nerve like that. Sometimes I'll put my thumb underneath the jawline here, right where you feel that little crevasse, and that's going upward is the hypoglossal nerve, so that's a good control. Hypoglossal pushes up like that, like you're running a knife up under the jaw. That's a good one. Some people use the mandibular angle as well, uh, just under the ear, into there. Whatever you like, cheeks, eyes even work. But I need to guide his nose to the floor. I'm gonna now get my head, my, my knee rather, on that side of his head, push his face to the ground, and as soon as his nose is facing, I squeeze. And usually what I do is, as the first knee is running down, and I get him down here, my second knee comes in and kind of lifts in and up, and I adjust them to leave him a little space. I don't want to put, if you imagine my knuckles being knees, I don't want to grind them and put constant pressure on the face like that because I don't leave any space. So just with my knees, I can learn to kind of lift and set. So there's a little air hole. So if I spin, I'm not rubbing his face. He has a little safety margin. Jordy's naturally going to want to continue with that motion, and he's going to have the instinct to get into a table and to crush you. So we have to stop it. So as soon as I bring the nose down, I'm intersecting and I'm hooking that arm. If he gets too strong, goes too far, we're going to do other stuff and we're going to abandon. We're going to go off. But for today, we're going to start by having a bit of success. I'm normally going to have my elbow at least in line with his ribs. I'm going to have my head stashed to the back so I have a good torque. And if he starts to pull from here, I should have pretty good power. Some people will put their hand all the way to the floor. That's fine too. And then if I need extra power, even with my feet apart, I'm going to look to see if I can just squeeze and pull his head away from the collar. So I'm pulling it away from his shirt. From here, there's all sorts of affectations, but I want to create elongation. And next, we're going to look at how we can lock, scissor, pedal work, and all that stuff. Simple, simple. We have pairs. We have triangles. So let's say I guide that face over, boom, I get him, and I get that, that macro gross motor hook. So now the very first thing I always want to do is hide my head here, because the likelihood that he can reach me with his heels are very low. If I go to the front, it's hard to stop him. I'm, he has access with the face, he has access with the knees. So I'm going here. So different things I want to play with just for sensitivity. I always want to be squeezing. So I'm squeezing like I'm juicing brain juice out of his nose. I want to be squeezing that head good and hard. If I go on my laces, there is a time for that if I want to lean back and crank his arm. So sometimes people, especially with group arrests and things like that, will just lean back and they'll just pull the arm straight out of the shoulder and that can, that can work sometimes. By comparison, if I go to the balls of the feet, when I go back, there's not as much stability for me. So by putting the, the laces down, I have a little bit more drag and there's already torque in the arm and good elongation through the ribs. If I go on the balls of the feet, balls of the feet now, it's more for mobility. So I see here I can waggle the hips if I think of my knees, my knees are like scissors. So if one knee starts to go around the other knee, just slightly like that, now I'm getting a tremendous scissor effect. My knees are on the head, one goes around, and it starts to push like you're controlling the reins on a horse. So if my right knee goes deeper and longer and further back than my left, I start to get torque and move his neck to the side. And that's what I'm looking for, right? If I want to amplify it, when I want to get my traction, I can crisscross, go on the balls of one foot, take my knees off the ground, and pull the head right out of the, out of the shoulders. So now there's tremendous torque. It's much more dangerous, and I kill him, but you're going you're gonna to hurt him if you're not careful. So I guide it, I pull through. That's the first thing I want to see. Laces is for leaning back. Sometimes you need this to open the space, especially if people are working or you're trying to do cuffing. Balls of the feet are for mobility. I can slide left and right. Or I can crisscross, lean. I'm usually putting most of my weight on my elbow. I'm choosing one rib and I'm going into deep inner joint. Bang, and you got a good crank. I sometimes need that as a little shock. Try those out just to build our sensitivity. 
So now, same position. Again, you can go light on this, right? So the key thing, if you, you want to train always for maximum resistance, but you don't have to train with maximum resistance, meaning I want gross motor, simple skills that are going to work when he's fully resistant. This kind of hook and high is about the simplest thing you can get. It gives you all sorts of options. And if it doesn't work, it gives you a chance to decide how you're going to bail out. And we're going to have two principal bailouts that we'll show in a few minutes. But at this point, I want to assume if I have control, whether it's by virtue of just a basic squeeze, a slight crooked head scissor, or whether it's a crisscross and an elongation with a bit of torque first, however you get it, normally my backhand is required for stability. I'm hiding my head, and I always want to be hooking here. Very often people will come up, and they can get long arm control like this, that works. Some people will overwrap like this and bend it, but now if I push here, Really, it's not painful, it's just kind of holding them in place, and it sometimes invites this kind of an escape. So the only time I'll usually do that is if I'm trying to really hold them and just pull them, search them. I'm not a huge fan of this. Normally, I want that hook, and I'm going to come back. Now, a lot of people from here will now go with their free hand. It's natural. It was on the ground. You gain control. They come up, and they start walking. And that's okay to the extent that you still have your underhook, but now this primary compressor, this move, is trying to pull the hand to the back, and it's very prone to sliding off the hand. So people have a difficult time. So it's a good rule to remember. I always want my front side arm to hook and scoop. You all have that. But if I'm going to go for any kind of figure four lock, I will only usually do it by switching the arm and then taking my front hand. And my front hand will be pushing the lock to the back, just like my front hand was formerly pushing the arm to the back. I want that front side hitting hand to be going through and doing the primary force, applying the primary force. If I switch to this and I kind of pull, I gave up balance for this, right? And then when I get here, if he starts to resist, I don't have a great hook and I usually fall back. But if by comparison I switch here and Jordy starts to go to the front, I can now push him to the back much more easily. So just start to have, I'm not hurting his head, I'm not squeezing too much, start to have a little bit of forward motion. If I keep my previous hook, which is good alone, and then try to do this, the amount that I'm giving up from the anchor is not equivalent to what I gain from the lock. It's a weak lock with a good anchor. So if I'm going to give this up normally, I want to be able to switch tight, and then the front hand is going to push. I'm barely even hurt. I'm just pushing. And now the desire to get balance is going from my hand to his. I'm trying to get balance with his hand. You're going to get much more torque, much more control. Right? So this way, even if you flinch, go totally gross motor, you're aiming all of your energy into his hand, his hand behind the back. And now this becomes even stronger than this. With a basic hook, his hand is in front. If I try to pull from the back, Jordy resists hard, right? He's, he's often going to come out, and now most of my energy has been pulled to the front, and I'm biting knees. But if I switch arms, and I push to the back, I have much more strength. If I have an educated lock, I grip it, I twist it, and push it to the back. Now I get pain compliance as well. But if nothing else, if I just drove the mass of his forearm to the back, I have good shoulder torque. I'm going light on his head for the class. Um, but that's the idea, is that I want all my energy bringing his arm, bringing his mass to the back to negate his turtling to the front. Yeah? So one arm, hook and hide. If you're going to go figure four, you're better to switch and drive with the other hand. Feel the difference. Don't take my word for it. Experience it. This makes sense, guys. So we want to keep it this pace all night, just get repetition, repetition. So I smear over, I get the face, I get this. I at minimum, if he's going crazy, I'm not going to leave this position. I'm going to stay under hook and I'm going to decide. And sometimes he's so crazy, I know I'm not going to attempt any kind of arm bar and I'm going to go to one of the other two positions. But if I neutralize him, I get a scream out of him with a bit of a crank, I squeeze, sometimes I smack the head on the ground, and now he calms down. Now I might decide I want better arm control, so I have the option of switching and working here. If I switched and it was a mistake and he's pulling my mass over, rather than chase it, if I cannot you know, bury an elbow and bounce it into a rib, elongate the head and bounce that to the back, if I can't get that to the back in one try, it's too resistant and I'm losing, I am better off, this is occupying space, I will literally daisy chain it. I will punch this one through and pull this one out whoop, and go like that. Sometimes if he's really tight, I'll even put my hands together and I'll pull it through to not lose the space that I have. And then I'll go back to this position. This is always my emergency default position. If I'm here now, I have two options. I can either go to my right or go to my left. Right. So the first one, we're going to go to my left, in this case towards the void, the front of his body. 
and we're going to keep my front knee tight as a pivot point, and my other one is going to kind of let a match wound come up very tight. I'm going to turn front, and I'm going to pull them over. That's where I want to be. I want to pull the joint out from the body and crank it over. If my hand is high on the shoulder, this is what you'll see in sport of wrestling. There's less torque. If it goes low in the joint, deep into the elbow, there's more rotational force, right? And that's going to hurt him more. He's going to want to tent up, so I need to counter it. It's not enough usually to just put pressure. Jordy can still lift. So normally I'm going to grab his face and pull it the other direction, or I'll take his hand off the floor. I'll take it right out, right? So that's the first one. So I want to see that from that position. I'm going to show you just from a slight angle. If I'm here, I have the arm and I'm in and I'm losing it, I'm going to take my backside leg around, pull it. If his hand stays stuck, I'm going to lever it out, try to get across, and normally pull up his head. As a good drill, you can do it softly. I can pretend from here I lose it. Jordy's going to roll out. As he rolls out, keep the arm and just pull back and go right back into a head scissor. Acquire the same position, try to get it to the back, see that I can get it to a hammer lock. If he's locking resisting, I try to get down, I lock it. If I lose it, he rolls out. I don't freak out, keep the trap, get back up, and try to get that sequence a few times so I see that I have an understanding of where it can go. If I put full weight on him, it's harder for him to roll naturally. If I pull up the chin, you're more likely to lock the spine. I'm not using a tremendous amount of power, I'm just holding him locked. Just twist that spine. If I lose it, he rolls. This is always still there. Hold on to it, get across him, and then go towards the head. As a basic floor. A few times and switch, a few times and switch. I showed some of you this one, but I just want to show you this. So, um, if I'm working, I've got the face down, I'm going towards the back, I'm trying to get him. Sometimes I lose it, but instead of him going to the belly, he can start to go to the back, right? And if he's in the back like that, it's dangerous, there's a bite zone here. If I don't have good head control and he starts to get away from here, sometimes, oh, I don't feel like I'm in a good position. So what I can do, I'm going to show from this angle, actually, I'll switch, just so you can see it clear. If he starts to go to his back, right on his back like that, yeah, and I got you like this, I'm going to always create misalignment. So I want to push his head towards the arm. I can clamp my hands together, some people will see grip, some people will, all sorts of different locks, but I, I just have to get it across, or even better, guide it, and then go to the knee. So from that position, tremendous force, you've got to be careful. And what I can do is create kind of a slingshot, where it looks like I'm going to go full force, I release the arm, push the head, and I switch. So it's a very simple drill. I'm going to move you back for the camera, Jordy. So let's say I have my conventional, I have him here, but instead of going to the belly, which this is designed to resist, he suddenly goes to the back. Boom, I start to lose it, he's in a bite zone, I flatten out, I'm trying to control him. I'm going to take his face, bam, towards the other side, by hand or by leg, and I'm working it here. So now his body wants to go that way, if I lead, boom, I switch hands. All right, so again, if I lose him to the back, right away, boom, cross it, very gentle. I put my leg in place. I ride it, wham, I take this one. Try to get as soft as you can, but it's a good reflex to have. All right, compound figure four, cross face lock. It's good. Try it out, guys. Say we have your, you have your resistant Ian on the ground, as you often do. If you get this kind of an underhook, sometimes people will work with like a scoop, right? And so the scoop is okay in the sense that you can kind of roll the muscle. So sometimes, for example, if Ian is starting to go like that, and I still have my my violin trap. See my head? I use it to hook just between my head and my shoulder. I hook this. And then the only way he can get out is by going there. Right? He has to come up the V. So if I'm here, and I, that's primarily hooking, so take your hand away. Right? See, it's harder for him to get out. I can keep putting it back. But if I, if I ideally had a choice, I would like to use my bone right at the wrist in here. Right? And that's going to lock it. So if he's turned a lot, his web shooters are forward, he's coming out, it can be hard just to guide it over. So I take my hand and I smear the muscle like a massage, and then I put it in. That's the easiest way to get it. Now we have the tricep right here, and we have the tendon right here. Tendons are running lengthwise like that. So if I, a lot of times we want to cause pain, we saw like this. But if I saw like that, I'm never really touching more than a centimeter at any time. If I saw like this, I'm always on the tendon, right? So the problem is sometimes I rotate horizontal motion, I lock it, horizontal motion, he starts to fight, so I, I want to cause pain and it comes out. But by comparison, let's say Ian has a bit of a bend and I'm having trouble, 
if I go up and down, oh, it takes about a second and a half, but then, oh, it, or the trout and the salmon are upstream in your brain. Look, he's all the way down like that. So even here, left and right, he's okay. It's a little bit of pain, but you hear him breathing. Up and down, oh, yeah. So even knuckles, up and down, always, right? And then you can choose to go where you want to go. So up and down. That's good. How you doing? So I'm gonna get Ian down for a sec. So uh, get crap head over here. So sometimes when you're going, you get this. You're trying to get them. You've got all that, and the person ends up going up into a table. You're losing it, and you end up in this kind of a position. So there's lots of stuff you can do. You can pursue the head. You can try to you know take them down. You can spike the back. But we're gonna look at how we can transition today to a side ride. So a side ride is basically this. Exactly the same as when I had the hammerlock, the underhook, I'm going to turn to face the opposite direction. And these are the rules for the side run. Right? The most important thing, he can be high, he can be low, he can be, sometimes his head is low, his butt is high, sometimes his butt is low, his head is high, sometimes he's totally in a ball. Rule number one, try not to reach over and go under the arm. Because it's hard to get this out fast and he collapses, he'll roll you. Right? So if Ian goes here, whoop, I get stuck and I end up going over. Right. So that includes what's called a turkey wing, which is the attempt to do this to take it out. That includes short hooks. Those are fantastic on the close side. Because if he collapses on this side, he's going to roll into me. But on the far side, normally I'm going to go maybe the trapezius sometimes, maybe the lat, but normally it's going to be stomach, hip, or my preference is inside a leg. I know sometimes people find it uncomfortable. You're going to the leg. First few tries, you have bad aim, so that's awkward. But I want to be here. And what I'm doing is I'm either grabbing his arm or underhooking his arm, sometimes even grabbing his forearm, sometimes cross-facing or pulling. But the idea is that I want to pull these apart and I want to run through them like a finish line. It's normally called a side ride, sometimes a spiral ride, because when I run through, I'm running in a circle. So if Ian's like turtled out really tight and I get here, if I just try to push him there, it can be hard. So what I do is I put my energy behind it and I snake one way or the other in a, in a circle like that. And I just kind of flat. And that's a good way to get somebody flat, right? Of course, you could grab fascia on the inner thigh or higher. You can do all sorts of stuff. But all I want to see is that, whoop, I slip it in. Ian gets in. He can have his elbows in a ball. He can be all closed up. It's very hard. If I turn my, my cup out and I punch that in, it's very hard for you to protect that. A foot is hard to get in, but that kind of emotion is pretty easy, right? Sometimes I'll grab just his wrist, same way, thumb down, punch in, whoop, and I pull that aside, and I can get an arm, right? And then I can start to work. From here, you could go back, do whatever you wish. All I want to see is this. From a failed north-south, he's in a turtle. I'm losing it. I'm going to have a hard time controlling him, and if I stay here for a second or two, he's just going to tackle me down. I turn in the direction of his face, and as I do that, my far side comes inside the leg, and then my other hand has a half second to choose where it wants to go, right? But at least get this. Sometimes you'll just stay here to lean and hit. That's a great ground control for ground and pound as well. If I do anything on this arm, it's gonna roll him back onto his side and then we're, it begets all the same positions we were in before. Side ride. Simple, try that out. What we're gonna do? If somebody's in a table, the kitchen a table. Yeah, so we're gonna look at ways we can isolate the legs, right? This is the idea. Um, it's very dangerous. It's, it's, you know, when people look at uh, submissions in sport, you can, you, the safest way to train it is to get beautiful traps, nice catches, and then it gives you choices. Sometimes you have that capacity in like more of a law enforcement restraint position, but it's also important to play with kind of destruction as well, because sometimes you got to kind of tweak the joint, take away capacity fast. For example, if I've got Ian in a tape, I have the ability with my leg on the close side to do some kind of a wedge and to get my knee through. Right? I can get it, and that allows me to start isolating a leg because now I have a leg in my crotch area, right? So I can wedge in through that opening. I have a wedgeable opening here. Ian, you got a wedgeable opening. So I can go under, under his thigh, literally. I can go under like a snake and come up. So even if he's sitting, right, I get in the muscle, I can lift, right? boom, that's a, that's a good, and it's hard for him to resist. I can wedge in and then I can grab, right? underneath his, his ankle. So whoop, on the close side, it's very easy. I get his ankle. So imagine, opening one, window one, is that, that thigh wedge. Number two is the hamstring, and then number three is under the foot, really. That's where, those are the three primary ways. Then we have the shared space, which is number four, which is up the middle, right? Up the middle is very hard. 
I, I tell you honestly, there have been you know very serious situations, not training, where I'm under or I'm having trouble mobilizing. If I take the hardest ridge of my fingers into the tailbone, perineum, anus, pull up, you're going to motivate sudden movement. It's not pleasant for any nobody. Uh, really will usually back up into that. It's a shock, it's painful, it's not easy. Another moth, what's going on? It's moth night. So I just wanna see how I can get in. So on the far side, I can use my hand. On the close side, I could use my hand, but normally I'm gonna push my knee through like that. And that's a good way to start, to start to get the, the body isolated. You can grab your own thigh. You now have the capacity to work on this leg and my other knee can start to separate. See, I'm splitting his base. One knee pushing one knee out, one hand pushing the other knee out. I could work with his pant leg. I could work with his foot, right? So if I start to scoop and take his legs apart like that, that's a very painful position for him. A little bit of outward pressure, kindly. And then if I start to pull it, right, at some point my thigh becomes a fulcrum and he's gonna wanna rock forward with that pubis. And then that allows me now to come up and isolate. Again, I'm just Squeezing, isolating, control. All right, so I'm gonna bore you again. I'm gonna hit you from this position. So imagine he's as tight as he can be, and he's not giving me any opening. I grab, boom, and that could be a hit, right? I could grab here, I could grab here. I separate that base, and I can start sliding that out. I want you to see if you can get on his back, right? Keep pressure. Again, how can I separate? I can separate, okay? pull this way, I can take the foot, I can drive, I can take toes, I could scoop just in here and pull and you'll flatten somebody out. It's hard, try to get up. It's not a comfortable position. And that's a good starting point. You just wanna see that. I could switch, I could grab that foot, I could push, I could go to space, I could connect them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the whole idea is I wanna get my legs around his first, his first leg. Oh, wow. That's my first wedge. And I'm gonna come in here. I could spike into the back, that's a flattener. I could start to work here, right? I can scissor here, I can also scissor over. Some guys will take both just to tie them up, especially if you're working in teams. But I want to see primarily that I can get this first triangle of leg somehow between my leg. And then I'm working around and just trying to control. And he gives you resistance, you see what you can do. Back to a turtle. Wedge. Isolate that a bit. Get something and pull it apart. Just be gentle here because you can tear the knee. Yeah. That's it and work all from the toes. You can lock, push. Locked. Woohoo! Pop it right there, nice and tight. Try getting up here. It's like Indian suplex hold that, right? They use this a lot in Gushti, Indian wrestling. You got a good grip. Hips are isolated. Try to hit me in the face. It's a hard, right? it doesn't have a lot of control. So very simple, but it gives you time to think. Complete hip vice. Thanks, Ian. Ooh, Make a wish first. Oh, uh, Ian, I remember when my, were hit, my hips were never that flexible. It was a Tuesday, I was dreaming. <laughs> Shh. Nice. So you see there, you're bringing his feet together a little bit. Yeah. Take his uh, left foot a little bit further out. What can you do to pull his, yeah, you want to pull his legs apart. Split yeah. the base, yeah, there you go. Now hide your face into his thigh. Tio, show the best elbow you have. What's, what do you got there? That's about it, right? Try to get into his face with your hand. That's about it. So yeah, you can shield, that's it. You can put your face behind his knee even if you want in. He can't really do much. Yep, that's it. He's not gonna reach you now. Yeah, that's, how, uh, that's actually bad for yeah. me now. Yep, that's a good one. You got a nice hip rend and a medial knee ligament rip. <laughs> Slowly turning Tio into a pound key. <laughs> that was it, that was it. Really, just anything. So go back in the same position. So get his... Yeah, the V of his leg in your groin, perfect. So anything you do to just pull that left leg away from the right, split that base. Hug, push, yep. Beautiful, nice. Now you've split the base in a whole new way. And possibly the pants. So guys, I'm gonna show you the, um, the I'll just get you laying flat, the most definitive way to do a, what's called a small package. Um, so. If I have somebody's leg, this is the idea. If I want to do leg knots, there are two basic ways. Number one is by putting my leg inside as a grapevine like that, and I'm cutting the leg deep into the, uh, to the knee joint. And what that allows me to do is by putting my non-compressible ankle, my hardness of my bone in the joint, and then by leaning, I'm fundamentally putting a, a sort of a, a wedge, a block inside the joint, and as the joint tries to close, it can't. So the weakest part fails, which is the connective tissue. 
bone's not gonna crush. 